I'm going to talk about why you might fear with domain-driven design. And um, let's start with a very simple question. So is this a great architecture? That's a typical question that I get answered when I do some kind of architecture review and the like. And we assume that this project that we are talking about is actually using all the technical domain-driven design patterns, such as service repository and so on. And this is what they came up with as an architecture. So you can see that there is some kind of UI integration server, aggregation service, there is a workflow service and several other things. And the question is, is this a great architecture? Now, let's Take a look at domain-driven design, and I think the term domain-driven design is actually a very good one because it clearly expresses what this is all about. This is about software that should provide business value, and it should support business processes. I would further argue that the typical changes that we do in our projects are actually to business logic, and therefore, we should let the domain drive the design, and that is all the... that is. The basic fundamental of domain-driven design, of course. I mean, the, the name clearly expresses that. Now, let's look at that architecture again. And it turns out that I can't even tell what the domain is. So, there are a lot of technical decisions that are expressed here. And I'm not saying that they are worthless or that they don't matter. However, if this is our architecture, it doesn't actually say anything about the domain whatsoever. And therefore, it's hard to judge whether it's a good architecture because a good architecture should support changes to the business logic. So in my opinion, this is not DDD, this is NDDD. And, you know, domain-driven design, that means that the domain drives the design. And NDDD means that is non-domain-driven design, so it's something else that drives the design, such as technologies and so on and so on. And as I already said, I think one of the ways to detect whether you are doing NDDD is ask the question whether you can tell which domain this architecture is for. So can that be an architecture for a self-driving car or a video game? And the architecture that I've just shown can be basically for anything. So it can be for the backend for some self-driving car, it can be for a video for the backend for some video game. We don't know. And in my experience, this is usually what I'm presented with. This is the architecture. These are the technical decisions that we make, and this is it. So you should ask yourself, would you rather show and discuss some technical stuff if you are asked to present the architecture, or is it rather uh, some business-related stuff? And usually, I'm at least presented with some some technical diagrams if I'm asked if I want to look at some architecture. The better way to do this is obviously to say, okay, this is how we are going to split apart the domain. So there is an invoicing process that issues invoices. There is a shipping process that makes sure that stuff actually gets to the customer. There is an order process and there is some relation. So once an order comes in, we should create an invoice and we should somehow ship the product to the customer. So this is the de these are the dependencies. And now we can start a discussion about whether this makes any sense or whether we can optimize it in any way. And obviously, it also means that changes to, let's say, the order process, for example, are in one component only. What else is there? Well, we could ask the team, the development team, to execute the business process the application implements. If they are able to do so, then it means that they actually really understand the domain. Another question is, when was the last time that someone in the team asked a talk to a user and a customer? And there are quite a few roles that you want to talk to. So there are the people who are actually using the application, but there are also managers of those. Um, and the managers can tell you what this application is uh, for in terms of the business, while the users can really give you all the details and what it's, what's going on on that, that detailed level. And you need both inputs because on the business level, you might want to change the processes and implement them somehow differently and work differently with them. Uh, and the users, of course, they are experts on what's going on on the very detailed level. Can you explain the business purpose of the application to your partner at home? That's another interesting question. If you're not able to do so, chances are that you don't really understand the domain and therefore it's hard to really come up with domain-driven design. And also an important question is, how does the architecture actually structure the business logic? Now, you could argue that at the end of the day, we are just 
developers, technical people, architects, these kinds of people. And what I'm talking about here are requirements. And that's, you know, for those other people who care about requirements. But domain-driven design means that we should structure the domain logic. As I've shown you, there should be boxes that actually talk about the domain. And therefore, the aim is to support the business as well as possible. So therefore, you have to understand the domain on that very detailed level to be able to come up with that model. So it's not enough to say, okay, there are some printed requirements, but you should actually understand them on a pretty detailed level because otherwise you can't come up with any usable uh, models. So therefore, domain-driven design is actually about collaboration. We as technical people can't really define what the business purpose of an application is. We have to have input from other people. So we have to ask and support business people. At the end of the day, we are the ones who have to support the business and therefore also the business people. And that might be hard because it might be hard to actually talk to those people. There might be lots of political struggles and conflicts inside the organization. And therefore, sometimes you might fail. Um, there are ways to support that. So there are collaborative modeling way, uh, techniques, for example, that allow you to get everyone in a room and share a model about the domain and uh, collaboratively uh, well model that domain and come up with it. So there are ways to deal with that. However, if the organization is dysfunctional, they won't be of a lot of help, I'm afraid. Next topic I want to talk about is bounded context. And again, I do like that term because bounded context is actually quite a great term. So it's about something, some bounds around, uh, well, something, and it's bounds around a model, which is basically executable code. So we are not about, talking about diagrams and the like, and a ubiquitous language, a language that you can use as a technical person, but that is also used by the business person. So it's ubiquitous in the sense that it's all over the place, not just uh, for technical people, but also for business people. And usually such a bonded context would be handled by one team. So an order process, a delivery process, as I've shown a few slides back, those are typical bonded context. And they are interesting because bonded context at the end of the day are modules and modules are what architecture very typically talks about. How do you structure your system? You structure them in modules. So bounding context is just another example of such modules. And I would argue that there is hardly any other concept that is so poorly understood like bounding context. So let me give you an example. How do I get, come up with some bounding context? So let's imagine that we have... a uh, some functionality. Let's say there is invoicing. And now I create a model that does the invoicing. And what that means is that I have a pile of code, some code structure that allows me to get a, an invoice. And, you know, an invoice would have um, the invoice address, uh, the the an invoice number. There are, in Germany at least, there are quite a few legal requirements around them. And it would also include uh, taxes like VAT. And now you have the next functionality. And in this case, the functionality is the calculation of the VAT. So in Germany, there are two uh, different um, uh, rates, VAT rates for different products. So in Germany, it's by product. And there has to be some logic that says, okay, this product has the full VAT and this one has the reduced VAT. And in other countries, it's different. Um, so in, in the States, in the United States, for example, uh, there is a sales tax and that is different by location where the, uh, where you sold the product. And now the question is, where do you put that? And in my case, I, I, I put that together with invoicing in one bounded context. And we can discuss about that, whether that makes any sense. But the point that I'm trying to make is we have to answer the question which parts of the business domain we would put together. And in my case, I decided that VAT and invoicing should belong together. Um, but we could do it differently, of course. And then we have the next functionality. So the next functionality is tracking. We need to know where the order is whether it's on its way or whether it be has been handled over to DHL or whatever. 
And we need to have some algorithm that figures out how to get stuff to the customer. So I have a clicker here, which is 100 euros. And uh, you want to send that out as uh, checked mail. And therefore, you would you have to have an algorithm that says, well, if it's 100 euros, it's so very expensive that I would rather send it out as, as checked mail. And um, if you have something that is less expensive, then you maybe just want to send it out unchecked and, you know, safe on the cost because you can just resend it. So if you have some some um, magazine, which is a few euros, then you just send it out if it gets lost. And this is, again, another bounding context. And again, we've made a decision to put these two pieces of business logic together in one module. Then we have a shopping cart. Um, so where we will put stuff in and put it out before we order it. We have accept order, and again, that is something that builds one bottom context. The point that I'm trying to make here is we want to structure logic functionalities into different bounded contexts. That's what we want to do. And there might be other bounded contexts, or people might think there might be other sensible modules. So, for example, the customer. And of course, the customer has some business meaning. However, if you think about it, Every functionality that we've seen in the last slide actually talks about business. Uh, sorry, it talks about customer. So we send out stuff to the customer, so it's in delivery. We um, write invoices for customers. So it's again about customer, also invoicing is about customer. And a customer orders stuff, so also that bound in context is concerned with customer. So once we have one module that talks about the customer, it's going to be used all over the place. And chances are, if we change anything like the, the business process for order, we would also need to change the customer. Therefore, we would need to change at least two modules. And that's probably not so great because we really want to contain changes in one module. Same is true for products, right? We write an invoice for a product. We check whether a product was delivered. We figure out how to deliver a product. And uh, also people order products. So we have the same problem here. So we could build a module that is called product. It's just going to be used all over the place. And it's going to be uh, a, a hotspot for changes probably. That's data-driven. That's not really domain-driven. And if you think about it, modules, um, I find this representation of a module quite useful. So it talks about the changeable internals of a module and the public information. So the idea is, if you have a module, there is internal stuff that should be easy to change because it's not visible from the outside. And there is some public information that limits what we can actually change. So if we have a class, for example, there are instance variables that are hidden from the outside and there are public methods. And if you have an account, fund, for example, you will have a balance. And of course, there has to be some method that says this is the current balance of the account. But whether that is stored in one instance variable or whether it's calculated on the fly is hidden from you. You know, you could store the balance of the account, but you could also uh, figure out the balance once you ask for it. So, and both actually make sense. If you figure it out on the fly, then it's easier to go back in time and do these kinds of things. Of course, if you have the uh, account balance stored, other things might be easier. So, for example, it might be faster. And you can change that model, whether you are using transactions and calculate it on the fly or whether you store the balance itself. You can change that without changing the public information. So, therefore, you're free to do so. And actually, back in the 20th century, we were using these kinds of uh, CSC cards to figure out what classes should be about. And they talk about, uh, well, the class, the responsibility. So in my case, it's an order service, the responsibility, which is accepting order, and the collaboration, so it, uh, how it collaborates with other uh, classes. And um, with bounded context, I would argue it's the same. So we have some code, we have some systems, we have some interface, and again, the implementation is hidden. And if you look at it, there is a bounded context canvas that you can download on, on the internet. There is a project uh, for uh, describing uh, domain-driven designs. 
And this, I would argue, is actually quite close to those CSC cards because the inbound communication and the outbound communication, how one bound in context talks to the others, is something that is about collaboration. The description and the ubiquitous language talk about responsibility. And obviously, there is no class here, right? The, the first C in CSC is for class. But, you know, bound in context class, it's basically the same thing. So the fundamental idea that we are talking about and that we can talk about on the level of classes, but also on the level of bound in context, is to build modules by functionality, not by data. And this is actually something that I'm quite serious about because this is so fundamental to building systems. We want to have functionality and we want to hide the functionality that we need to build those systems inside those modules, such as classes and bound context and so on. And there is one interesting thing, uh, thing that you might or might not have noticed. The CSC card actually doesn't talk about data. There is no such thing as data on this uh, card. And the same is true for the bound and context. So it's actually a very different approach. And obviously, to build something like a payment bound in context in this example, you do need some data, but that's an afterthought. That's not what you start with. And I think that's very fundamental. And if you think about it, um, actually, the data is quite different. So let's look at the invoicing process. So in the invoicing process, we need to have a customer and we need to have the building address. Uh, so here's an example uh, with InnoQ. The company has an Amazon account and I, as an employee of InnoQ, can actually order stuff uh, using that account. So the customer account in terms of invoicing would be InnoQ in, in Monheim, some place in uh, some small place in Germany. Um, and we would also have a model for product such as the price. We are interested in the price. If you look at shipping, we are interested in the customer too because we need to figure out where to send stuff to. But if we stick to the InnoQ example, I actually live in Kaiserslautern, which is quite distant from um, Monheim. I think it's like 200 kilometers or so. And I want to get stuff delivered here, not to uh, InnoQ in Monheim. So the customer in terms of, uh, of, sh uh, of shipping is actually me while the customer in terms of invoicing is actually the company in InnoQ GmbH uh, in, in Monheim. And those are very, two very different things. And for a product, again, we are interested in different stuff. We are interested in sizes, weight, and these kinds of things, um, not so much in the price. Uh, while the size, for example, doesn't really make any difference for the invoicing. And finally, there is the order process. And in the order process, we need to have product preferences for the customer and uh, the marketing information for the product and so on. So if you look at bound and context and modules in general, the data model is internal and it hides most of the design decisions, for example, how data is stored. And I would argue if you start using bound and context, they become naturally great modules, modules because you're basically using an approach where you're focusing on the functionality and therefore, you will have a module where the functionality is exposed and the data model is hidden internally. There are other alternatives. So, for example, you can have a database and then you can have lots of different modules using that database, that very same database schema, for example. And that might not be such a brilliant idea because then the modeling is exposed and cannot be changed. So in this example, if you change anything in the database over here, it'll influence all of the modules and therefore it's going to be hard to change it. And the same is true for an event. So if we have an event here with all the data about an order, for example, and this is read by lots of modules, then again, you end up in a situation where this is really hard to change because the information is exposed. And I did a video about that um, a rather short one, I think it's less than 10 minutes, that talks about how Kafka paves the way to such more or less monolithic um, data models and data applications. Okay, um, what else have, have we got? Migrating to bound context. And this is interesting because 
before the migration, oftentimes we might have uh, a shared database with lots of shared data between different functionalities. And as I mentioned before, we actually want to end up in a situation where we have separated databases and separated models because they are much easier to change. If we achieve that, then we do have independent modules. We have a lot less coordination because it's much easier to build functionality all by your own. And probably you're going to be uh, more productive using that approach. However, if you do that, then this is going to be a lot of lots of effort. Oftentimes it's years. So if you have built a system in 10 years, chances are that the until you migrate it over to Bounded Context, it's going to be the same order of magnitude. So it's going to be years. It's not going to be weeks or, or months. And the question here is the business value. If we just end up with better productivity, it means that maintenance is easier, but that's not a, a goal because the real goal is to get changes to the business implemented faster. So it's actually about supporting changes to the business. That's what matters. Otherwise, maintainability is not of any uh, value. And therefore, we have to ask the question, what is the first step and what is the value of the first uh, of the few first few steps? And also in this regard, it's important to let the domain drive, in this case, the migration, because we are doing domain-driven design, uh, the domain should also drive the migration. And therefore, we have to ask, where is the business value? We have to find, figure out how to justify our changes, our migration in business terms. And one of the interesting questions, why are we doing this migration now? Why, aren't we, why haven't we done it like a year ago? Why are we, are we not going to do it in, in, in a year? Why precisely at this time? And oftentimes it's because there is some business change, right? So maybe you're focusing more on a online commerce. Maybe you want to go to international, these kinds of things. And now all of a sudden your old uh, software system doesn't fit those needs anymore. And therefore you need to migrate it. Some alternatives that you might have is you might build a new separate bound context for a new feature. So here is the old system. And there is a new feature, and this new feature by itself already justifies a new bounded context. Not sure whether that's a migration because, uh, well, the old system is more or less unchanged, but at least it's going to be easy to implement that new feature, and at least the mass that that old system represents doesn't grow. So you know, it's it's it might be a very good uh, approach. Then you might use um, transient bubble bounded context. So inside your old system, you implement a new feature in a bounded context. And this is something that Eric Evans himself, he is the author of the original Domain of Design book, um, explained. And I did uh, an episode in my stream about that. I'm afraid it's in, in German. Uh, so if you if you don't understand German, then you need to stick to the original paper. One of the interesting things here is that Eric actually said that it's fine for that new bounded context to become, well, fossilized and unchangeable. So it's not really a migration strategy where you end up with lots of bounded context, but it's rather a strategy where you build a new feature, you understand how to build bounded context so there is some learning, but you're not trying to really change uh, the system. And therefore, I think it's an interesting different approach. And finally, there is a third approach. So you define a core domain, the domain that really matters, the one that is really, really important. So maybe you're changing to uh, to um, to be to make shipping more reliable and you want to differentiate yourself by by the shipping uh, to be to be well uh, really really great. So in that case you would say okay shipping is what matters. And then you would prioritize those modules. So you would say, okay, here is uh, some stuff that is mostly concerned with shipping due to the fact that the old system might be badly structured. You might not be able to actually um, do that very clear cut, but maybe that's mostly shipping. So we prioritize that and the other stuff is less important. So we deal um, with that with, with le less priority. 
So in all of those cases, you will probably not end up with that ideal final architecture where you have those separated boundary contexts, which I talked about beforehand. And um, I'm not sure whether that's the goal because that's a lot of effort. And the question is, what do you get uh, out of that? So I would argue that the, the migration, well, it's sort of a weird situation because understanding bond context and doing building them is really, really hard. But in this case, you need to make some decisions to be to improve the situation. And of course, ideally, if time and resources wouldn't matter at all, you would migrate your systems to boundary context, but you have to compromise. And those compromises might be quite significant, and then you end up with uh, something completely different. And here are some questions that you might ask. So why is the migration done now? Because that talks that might give you some hints about the business goals. What are the next plan changes to the system? Because those are the ones that you should support during the migration process. And that might give you some ideas about strategy. And also another interesting question is, what has the business given up asking for? Because those might be things that you might be able to implement using during or after the migration. So in conclusion, what I really wanted to talk about is that well, domain-driven design means that the domain drives the design. And I noticed how in the last few months, I started to say that quite frequently in in um, consultings and in design sessions, because this is the fundamental idea. This is what it's about. And oftentimes this is forgotten and then you end up you end up building something that doesn't really support the business so it's interesting to keep or important to keep that in mind all the time so you actually need to learn and understand the domain and things become obviously harder if you migrate over uh, to bona context if you found this interesting, um, here is an email address. Um, and if you send an email to that email address, you will get uh, the slides. So they are not uploaded yet, uh, but I will do so in, in a few minutes. And you also get uh, some of my free booklets or all of my free booklets uh, that you can read through uh, concerning service meshes and so on and so on. Here is some data privacy uh, remarks. So this is powered by Amazon Lambda. So it's a small serverless function and therefore a microservice. So your email address will be locked for 14 days. And if you misspell the email address, uh, then I will handle them manually. So the email address is wwsas2023 at evolve.com. Uh, wwsas for Worldwide Software Architecture Summit. Uh, and I'm looking forward uh, to the Q and A later on. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you very much for this session. It is very insightful, and uh, I can already see that there are quite interesting questions pending for the Q and A session. But we will wait with these questions until the session actually comes. So see you soon in, uh, uh, I guess, it's around one and a half hour until that time.